are today on the last day of Regional Conference on Freedom of Religion in the 21st Century Muslim Societies, brought to you by no other than Islamic Renaissance Front. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to extend our gratitude to all speakers, staff and participants who have been tirelessly contributing to the success of the event. And on behalf of the participants, thank you very, very much to Dr. Farouk, he's not here yet, and team <laughs> for putting up such an important event as an avenue of learning and discussing um, issues pertaining to freedom of religion. As a group, we have been utilizing our rights enshrined under the federal constitution, our rights to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, and another freedom of religion. Importantly, we did all this without, alhamdulillah, the presence of hate speech. Tiada tanpa menampa, tiada baling kerusi. Paling penting, hampir tiada yang tertidur. Oh, ada eh, okay. So, sesuatu hampir. Okay. Okay, just as a side note, since some have been expressing concern on the need to have litmus test when it comes to freedom of speech, um, I will just, I would love to share um, some of uh, my information uh, that I have um, that perhaps we can look to case in United States uh, on uh, that the freedom of speech there is also enshrined in the their Constitution, which is um, the First Amendment of Bill of Rights. There in the United States, variety of tests have been established by the Supreme Court spotters constructed by numerous precedent cases. Rather than towards the society, the scrutiny is imposed towards the government, meaning that the government have very limited power to regulate freedom of speech. There, the government can regulate speech directly only in limited public forums or non-public forums. The regulations must be viewpoint neutral and reasonable to serve a legitimate interest of the government. Basically, government is required to prove that they are valid and alarming interests before restraining any form of speech. This is basically called time, manner and place restriction. Um, a part of that, the government also need to make sure that uh, once they impose the restriction, it needs to be content neutral, um, narrowly tailored, serve a significant governmental interest and also leave open ample alternative channels for further communication. There are also other tests like Miller tests that have been established uh, through precedent cases in um, spotters, uh, which used to scrutinize obscenity in speech and expression. This is just a part of many other tests that um, already been established in the United States um, uh, in regards to freedom of uh, speech and expression. Okay, so enough with that. I really want to. I always find a try to find a platform to share. Um, how um, U.S. government are dealing with um, um, basically civil liberties enshrined under their constitutions, and since it, uh, they are very um, they are a mature um, uh, country, so I think that uh, we have a lot to learn from the U.S. Um, compared to uh, you know uh, a part of just uh, learning from um, U.K., India, and other parliamentary um, uh, countries. So, enough with that. Um, our final program on tentative for today is a forum on Islam and politics, the challenge towards a progressive Malaysian Muslim society. At least during the past two days, we have been discussing on law and policy reforms related to freedom of speech, which need to be revised. Perhaps we should also need to newly enact some law to cater the massive trials and turbulences faced by many Malaysians. Um, though a good law doesn't ensure an equally good implementation and results, but we can't deny that in modern state, law and policy is core to pertaining public order, security, peace and harmony. To further this, this, this discussion, we have a line of politicians plus um, an academician for our dis discussion today. Uh, I pass the mic to Ehsan. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Adila, for your welcoming speech. And I would like to greet everyone here again for our third day, uh, basically the final day. But as usual, we can never finish a conference on Islam without mentioning about politics, right? <laughs> and to further continue with our discussion, I would like to first invite uh, our panel of speakers. Maybe I can start with Dr. Zulkifli, YB Liu Chin Tong, and also Professor Noraini to the front. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, fellow speakers. OK, um, yeah. We're going to start a Sunday morning talking politics and Islam. OK, as you all have known and introduced by our uh, introducing speaker, Adila, the topic of our discussion today is Islam and politics challenges towards a progressive Malaysian Muslim societies. Maybe as a brief background, when we talk about Islam and politics, particularly in the Malaysian Muslim society context, there are a few things which maybe we can just recall, or maybe a few events or occasions which we can consider as important. I just go through briefly a bit of some historical perspective, which I think is important for us to take note. First, when you look back, on what actually shaped Islam and politics in Malaysia. First, the most important event, as elaborated quite in detail by um, Professor Chandra Muzaffa and also Professor Shad Faruqi in our previous sessions, is the formation of Malaysia itself as a modern nation. So mainly the formation of our own constitution, Islam is clearly being put as the religion of the federation and definitely there's an equal citizenship status to all and there's definitely we also have a dual legal system, the Sharia and the civil court. This in a way shaped the framework of politics in Malaysia. And some would consider this constitution itself provides the foundation for a progressive modern nation, for a, uh, a modern majority Muslim society. So that is one point. And second point, we also know that towards later, in perhaps in the late 70s, there's also a phase of which is well known to be the Islamization phase, in which this phase started mainly with a wave of Islamic Jama'ah shaping the civil society at the time. And later, politically speaking, there's a very strong contestation between past and also uh, AMNO at that time championing who might be the best Islamic party, not really Islamic party, who may best represent the interests of the Muslims at the time. And that later turns out into an advancement and expansion of Islamic institutions in bureaucracy in Malaysia. That happened way until, I think, toward the end of the 1990s or, uh, or also in the early 2000s as well. Some may see this also as a progression, a progressive situation in Islamic related matters. And then this is also important period which happened, I'm, I'm sure this is a very important period in Malaysian politics in 1998 and which we actually continue, I, I would see it as towards until 2013, the period of the reformacy. Here is where the progressive discourse in some ways expanded, not just beyond the so-called intellectual or urban uh, uh, population of the country, mainly discussing Islam and how does it relate to democracy, human rights, justice, and also in fact pluralism in Islam, reaching the Malay crowd. And there is some tendencies that the, the values, the universal values, usually we talk and we, uh, we have discussed, including on freedom of religion, expanded. This is also can be seen as a progression, a progressive situation in when it comes to Islamic discourse. Politically speaking, some see this is a, uh, as something very fundamental in the formation of the Pakatan Rakyat, the alliance which were able to bring together two parties between two poles. At that time, at least in 2013, on my left side, uh, a representative from the DAP, sorry to say, and on my right side, at that time, 2013, a representative of the Malaysian Islamic Party passed. <laughs> at that time, at that time. But what has happened since then? Because in 2013 onwards, suddenly, out of a sudden, in, in fact, if we go through at that time, before 2013, the Prime Minister himself, uh, Prime Minister Datuk Seri Najib, he also keeps on talking about liberalization at that time. He even branded in a very progressive and moderate uh, discourse of Islam. But post-election in 2013, I would see it as there is something like a U-turn when it comes to how the government, the political parties are dealing with uh, the issues of Islam in the Malaysian Muslim context. So based on that brief background, now we have moved 
from 2013 and now we have already reached the year 2017. Some people are expecting the election would be maybe coming soon, either in the late 2017 or it could also be in the early 2018. Maybe in this room at least, maybe at least we have two politicians here, maybe they know better when that would, happen, would be happening. So this, based on this brief discussion on progressive politics related to Islam, particularly focusing on the Malaysian Muslim society, we would like to discuss more in this session. But before we elaborate more about that, it is also important for us to take note. What do we mean by progressive Muslim society? We usually talk about progressive Muslim ideals, which also includes the ideals of freedom, human rights, uh, democracy, things like this. But at the same time, we may have different ideas on what do we actually mean by progressive politics. So based on this, I think we can start our discussion. I will start with introducing our list of speakers, first of all, um, on my right, straight right, Professor Nurani Osman. She's a professional research fellow of Sisters in Islam. She was also one of the seven founding members of SIS until 2013, was its board member. She was also a founding research fellow of ICMAS, UKM, and until January 2011, principal fellow and professor in sociology of religion, specializing in issues related to Islamic societies, human rights, rights and empowerment of women, democratization and globalization. Among her most important publications are Sharia Law and Modern State, Nation, a Malaysian Symposium, Gender, Culture and Religion, Equal Before God and Equal Before Men. Interesting. Grounding Human Rights, Argument in Non-Western Culture, Sharia and the Citizenship Rights of Women in a Modern Islamic Nation State. And there's quite a number of lists of other uh, uh, important uh, papers and um, maybe perhaps also books being written. The other speaker on my left this time, uh, Yang Buhrumat YB Liu Chintong, elected as member of the Malaysian Federal Parliament of, Kul of Kluang in May 2013 election. Previously was a member of Parliament for Bukit Bendera, uh, 2008 to 2013. Since 1999, YB Chintong has served DAP in various capacities and is now a member of his Central Executive Committee, serving as a Political Education Director. YB Chintong graduated with a degree in Political Science and an Honours Degree in Asian Studies from the Australian National University, ANU, and holds an international master's in regional integration from Asia Europe Institute, University of Malaya. Chint uh, Chintong was the executive director of Penang Institute and research for social advancement, REFSA, and was formerly a visiting research fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, Singapore. And last, definitely last but not least, Dr. Zulkifli Ahmad is the strategy director of now is Parti Amanah Rakyat, I need to clarify that. Okay, an Islamist Democrat and former MP of Kuala Selangor. He was trained as a toxicologist from the Imperial College UK. He has a lot, uh, has authored uh, a book, Striving for Change, uh, and Najib Nomics, Rahmat Atau Malapetaka. The, the book sounds like a question, but I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> Maybe you all can answer it later in our discussion. Dr. Zulkifli was a former director for PAS Research Center and an executive member for PAS. He is a prominent Islamist leader that promotes Islamist democrat agenda, even while in PAS before. Okay, so that's the background of our speakers. So I think I will start with, uh, with um, YB Zulkifli Ahmad himself. Um, I'll start with the left, of the right. <laughs> No worries. No worries. Okay. I'm center. <laughs> okay. Centrist. Okay. Now I'm moderating already. <laughs> okay. Based from the request, uh, starting by Prof. Noraini, let the man start first. I prefer to Dr. Zukifli, and Dr. Zukifli prefers for why will you sing song? <laughs> so definitely, uh, I'm being very gentleman here. Okay. So based on that request, I think uh, I will uh, give the opportunity for why will you sing? Okay. So, to start with the discussion of the issue, but also important to note, I hope Wabi Chintong could also mention, what is your vision, your view and direction of progressive politics related to Islam in Malaysia, without further delay? 
Thank you, Ehsan, uh, Dr. Noraini Othman, uh, Dr. Zulkifi Ahmad, uh, fellow Malaysians who are here today. A very good morning to all of you. Um, I did expect to speak first, and I regret to to be to be here as a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'm here as an academic, uh, like Dr. Noraini, uh, which I was attempting to. Uh, I was trying to be trying to research on uh, political Islam, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I was elected. <laughs> um, and I, I regret to tell you that I am not the Prime Minister, so I cannot tell you when election is to be called. <laughs> um, I would like to start with a story and uh, with three parts uh, of uh, my presentation. One is on the intellectual, uh, sorry, international context. Secondly, on uh, the domestic context or his historical context over the past 50 years. And finally, uh, hopefully, uh, to answer Asan's question, what is my wish list? Uh, the story was this. Uh, when I first arrived at ANU, I attended uh, a course on a course called Introduction to Anthropology. And what struck me was, was something that uh, my lecturer said at the, at the first day of lecture. She was a researcher and she was an anthropologist researching on Kalimantan, the Indonesian side of, uh, of uh, Kalimantan. And she stayed in a Christian village for months and months and months. Couldn't, and she was a Christian. She couldn't understand why at every Christian prayer, pork was used. Until one day she ventured out and realized that she was surrounded, uh, the, that village, that particular village was surrounded by seven or eight. Muslim rel religious. Pork is never used in elsewhere as uh, part of the uh, Christian ritual. But in that particular village, it became an identifier. It, de be de it became uh, an identifier for minority-majority debate. So to understand some of this debate in Malaysia and worldwide, I think very often a lot of issues are non-important or not part of the essential. However, because of this minority-majority debate, very often it becomes uh, identifier in an identity politics debate. So I think with that in mind, when we think about uh, history in the last 50 years, very often things which are not religious or not part of the religious debate became very important. Or some which, is, which has a very small role in our religion came to the fore and became the defining debate. And I think that is something that we have to always remind ourselves that uh, identity politics colored our debate. I want to go to, I want to talk about uh, what has colored the international debates and how the international debate has somehow has an impact on us. I think there are, perhaps uh, I, I list out five important international or global events that has some impact on our domestic debate. I, this is not an, an exclusive list, but I just want to list out five major international events over the past 50, 60 years that has some impact on our debate domestically. Uh, first, I think, of course, British colonialism and the Indian debate plays a lot of role in our debate. Uh, the debate between whether we should have a secular state or an Islamic state to a large extent, has something to do with the debate between Nehru and Pakistan and the 1948 Indian partition. Now, we don't talk about the Indian part of it, but actually, a lot of debate has the origin from that context. And of course, maybe uh, Zakir Naik can be seen in, that, is seen in that context as well. Sometimes I, I, I wonder whether we need a Malaysia, Malaysian message and whether Malaysian scholars, Malaysian politicians, Malaysian Islamists, uh, whether we need a stronger Malaysian message or Malaysian understanding and to understand what is from India and what is domestically uh, important to us. Because uh, the debate bet between the Nehru's and Pakistan, if you look at Modi today, somehow it's irrelevant because Modi, India under Modi is quite religious, <laughs> whether you like it or not. But Modi comes from a religious party. And I was told that uh, Najib has just hired 
one of Modi's advice though, to advise him from the other side. <laughs> strategies. One of Modi's strategies to advise Najib to use Islam in politics rather than to use Hinduism. Uh, Modi uses Hinduism in politics. And uh, the same strategies are to advise Najib to use Islam in Malaysia to achieve the same result as Modi's. I'm not sure whether that will be effective or not. The second debate, global debate, of course, is the Middle East conflict. I was just reading The Economist uh, for this week and to realize that six, the Six-Day War is 50 years old. The 1967 Six-Day War is 50 years, 50 years old. And the Middle East conflict has, has in, a, in many ways, colored our debate domestically. Um, and of course, Egypt, and especially Ikhwan, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, has an overbearing influence on our debate in Malaysia. Now, Ikhwan is essentially a, uh, a resistant movement. Apart from Moshi's uh, two, one, one year presidency, in the last 50 years, Ikhwan is to a very large extent a, a resistant movement trying to survive the daily oppression from the regime. Interestingly, past won a state government, actually passed once two state government in 1959, in the 1959 election. But at that time, for, for the Egypt, Egyptian Islamic movement, they can never dream of coming to power. And indeed, only until Arab Spring that there was such an opportunity. I think the context of Malaysia and, and the Middle East, in particular, the context in which Ilhan is operating in, is very different, in which Yuhuan is a re resistant movement, suppressed and oppressed by the regime, and by the regime supported by United States, and also to a large extent uh, linked to Israel. I think we need to somehow move away from that resistant movement, because in, in the resistant movement, the message needs to be very simple. The message needs to be very, very simple. So Islam is the solution. <laughs> Islam is everything. But in daily life of a multi-ethnic society in Malaysia, governing is complex. Governing is complex, and I think we need a solution that is not simplistic, but multifaceted. And that is where I think the global debate has a has colored a lot of our discussion here. Perhaps we should see how to move away from that. Of course, the Saudi money, a third, third part of history is Saudi money um, after the oil, oil uh, boom in 1973, and, of, and also the 1979 Iranian revolution uh, has ignited the fervent for, for Islamic revival. September 11 also heightened the sense of minority versus majority, but on a global scale. On a global scale, Muslims felt that they are being oppressed, especially um, with a war on, with, with war on terror, with a war on Iraq, which was built predominantly on lies, on uh, George Bush lies. And I think that that has left an impact globally, and we can't run away from that. And uh, of course, the uh, Arab Spring and, and its resultant euphoria, as well as uh, the, the existence of ISIS, Daesh, uh, all this has an impact on our domestic politics. Domestically, from the 1970s, uh, Islamic movement filled the void. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim filled the void of PAS, when PAS was part of Barisan National. PAS was part of Barisan National between 1973 and 1977. And during that period, the Islamic movement came to, came to the front and, and filled the void of, uh, of uh, PAS as, a, as, a, as an opposition movement. The 80s was colored, or uh, the 80s was remembered by the competition between Dato Sri Anwar in the government and um, Dato Sri Hadi's brand of Islam in PAS. In April 1982, Dato Sri Anwar joined Barisan National a week before the 1982 general election and became the face of UMNO 
uh, face of Islam in Amno. And in October 1982, there was a, a coup within PAS at the PAS General Assembly in 1980, October 1982, and re that resulted in uh, the Young Turks takeover, and that included Dato Sri Hadi and uh, uh, Dato, Dato Fadeno and the rest. Between 1982 and 1998, the competition was predominantly between Dato Sri Anwar's and Hadi's brand of Islam, and a competition of who, which group is, is actually purer. Because in that debate, Anwar was trying to accommodate Islam within the political system, and Hadi's brand was trying to show that there is a, holy, there is a holier version, or there is a purer version of, of Islam. But 1998 changed the entire debate, because Anwar was out of, out of the government, and the opposition came together. In very much between 1998 and 2008, I think that 10 years was mostly on common issues on, uh, on the Islamic movement mo mo working as the opposition or effectively providing the base for the opposition for about 10 years. The 2008 general election shocked everyone and that tsunami somehow created a new debate. Uh, the, the new debate was Amno was not prepared to concede power, Amno was not prepared to lose, and Amno basically has two ways to choose. One is to reform and accommodate and actually move to the center, back to the Wawasan Norwegian 2020 idea. You see, between 19, 1991 and 2005, under the idea of Norwegian 2020 and Bangsam Malaysia, there was very hardly any conflict because Mahathir was moving to the center. And uh, but during that period of time when Mahathir needed an enemy, it was always the Jews, the Americans, uh, the British, uh, the Australian, and uh, the most convenient one, the Singaporeans. <laughs> but hardly local, hardly local. So there were very little local conflict. And between 1991 and 1997, before the crash, before the economic crisis, um, the idea that Malaysia will become a, a progressive nation, Malaysia will be, become an economic powerhouse, was very strong among the ordinary people. So that period of time, uh, AMNO was able to deliver Islam, progress, economic well-being, and a whole host of ideas. But of course, the uh, economic crisis ended those sort of possibilities. But anyway, 2008 onwards, AMNO's choice was either to move to the center and reform to ensure that it has no corruption, to ensure that it is, uh, it is economically uh, serving ordinary people, or to choose a line which Amno has chosen, that is to move further away from the center and become, and only focusing on trying to be more Islam or more Malay-centric. And I think between 2008 and now, uh, almost nine years later, or nine years later, we, ha we have seen the result. Over the la last, last nine years, it has been, it has been the, the atmosphere has been, uh, a very heightened, and that heightened atmosphere was as exacerbated after the 2013 election. Since 2014, it has been clear that AMNO was trying to work with PAS in order to create a de facto alliance. And in this de facto alliance, the debate of Hudud, the debate of uh, 355 has become a, a major, major debate. I feel that uh, between 1982 and 2014, 2015, 2016, since it has been 35 years, and it has been 35 years, and this 35 years, has, Malaysian society has changed a lot. In 1982, Anwar promoted Islamic finance, Islamic education, or Islamic university, uh, Islamic banking. Anything that has some, uh, the Islam branding is good, is welcomed by, by Muslim society back then. And in order to present a purer version, uh, passed under Hadi and Fadino at that time they presented the idea of Hudud. And Hudud became a major debate. But I think 35 years later, there are so many more Malaysians, Malays in particular, were educated to understand Islam. And there were many, many, many more people who became Ustas uh, of various training. The debate is no longer simplistic. I think we... we whether we like it or not, some people don't, don't like to see that many, that many ustas in our society. But I think the good thing is, 
The debate is no longer monolithic. The debate is no longer monolithic and simplistic. We, some, you cannot push a very simplistic 1982 idea thinking that people will accept here, now, 35 years later. i just give an example. Uh, when I was uh, uh, touring, I, I joined Kisiang and we w went to visit uh, Jordan, we went to Turkey and some places. When we meet Malaysian students, I, I, I always joke with them. I say, in 1982, we can sell anything as long as there is an Islamic labor. But today, you have to be very careful because everyone is more knowledgeable than the politicians, uh, whether they are Muslim or not Muslim. Uh, usually, politicians don't read. <laughs> and I say, today, you just ask someone, if, uh, if a law... In 1982, you can sell sukuk. Basically, the idea of sukuk, the idea of Islamic banking, the, the idea of Islamic finance is good. But today, you tell someone Islamic finance is good, but that particular sukuk, that particular Islamic bond is going to finance one MDB. Is it halal or haram? I think half, half of the people will say haram. I think we are, we are moving into a more sophisticated debate. So anyway, uh, to answer Isan's question, and to answer today's debate, I think uh, my, my wish list for Islam or the debate about Islam in Malaysia is that we all recognize that there's only one center, one political center. And for, for a multi-ethnic nation that spans across South China Sea, uh, there's only one political center. Whoever who can win across ethnic line, across religious line, and across South China Sea, that will form the government. I think who, whether UMNO or the opposition has to realize that a fringe message, while Trump won on a fringe mes message based on technicality, a fringe message will not be able to govern. You need to be able to occupy political center that win across ethnic line, win across religious line, and win across the South China Sea in order to govern. And I think that message is important. And I also hope that uh, when the, uh, I hope that scholars and also uh, thinkers as well as uh, students and, uh, and politicians in this country will have clearer idea about what we want to achieve with Islam and with the political debate in Malaysia with a national context. Uh, we understand the global context and we need to understand the global context in order to have our Malaysian context clearer to all of us. And I also hope that uh, in the globalized world, especially after September 11 and the, the, the trouble that created for, the, for Muslim minorities in Western society, there is a realization that the minority majority situation is within a country uh, has to be understood in the global world in the sense that while Muslim may be ma majority in this country, but the message has to be universal in the sense that whatever that is done has to be applicable to minorities, Muslim minority in Western society. Whatever we think that the Muslim minority should be protected and we should strive for protection of minority rights in Western country, but the message has to be universal and coherent. And I think uh, I understand that there are there are KS uh, cast uh, representative here, but um, I'm a social democrat, and I think a program. <laughs> Sorry for making fun of you. Uh, I think a progressive Islam needs a progressive economic message. See, part of the problem that we face over the last decade or so is that after the financial crisis in uh, or the global financial crisis in 2008, there is cro chronic unemployment in Europe. And that also causes economic problem to Middle East. And of course, we also face with the stagnate, stagnated economy over the past decade. A progressive Islam needs to be able to deal with bread and butter issues, needs to be able to deal with economic well-being of ordinary people in order to, uh, in order to, to move beyond. And in the, a world of Trumps, um, the idea of democracy seems to be losing its uh, luster. 
But Islam, perhaps a progressive Islam, needs to, needs to build a Muslim democracy discourse that is beyond mere imitation of Western institutions. It is not just the adoption of Western institutions, but a, a homegrown understanding and appreciation of democracy as a spirit, as, as a guiding spirit of the society. And finally, who will become the model of Islam, of progressive Islam, of democratic Islam? Is it Turkey anymore? Or is it Indonesia? And my hope is that at some point of history, in the years to come, in the decades to come, Malaysia will become the role model. Thank you. So, how YB Lu Chintong has set the expectation for Malaysian Muslims? Model, Malaysia would be the next model of democracy in the world. Could that be the case? Who might be best to answer that? I think at least in the room here, I think without further delay, I would welcome Professor Zulkifli Ahmad to continue on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esan. Hello, panelists. Uh, Prof. Nuraini. YB Liu Chintong. And of course, most uh, distinguished audience and participant. Uh, may I begin with Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Right. Honestly, I'm going to go against the grain of public speaking to begin with an apology. Never to begin with an apology. For, but, but today, uh, I have to uh, begin like that. Um, Mm. I was really hoping that uh, Prof. Nurani would take the floor first. <laughs> and she had conquered, she had agreed, uh, but again, uh, we failed to, you know, inform Ehsan. Uh, whatever be it, uh, um, I will immediately go into this. And I'm going to speak, hopefully not from my text, I'm going to speak from my from my, my heart to your ears and your heart. I, I would want to do that because I don't think I, I'm no longer, I'm, I don't think I'm anymore in academics. I don't have to, you know, pretend to present a very academic, yeah, that would be certainly a son, you know well. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so it's gonna be a, you know, a, a sharing kind of thing. And fair enough, YB Ching Tong has taken the floor and opened up quite a, a, a the narrative of, of, of Islamic uh, evolution, to, so to say, yeah, on, on, on particularly with reference to Malaysia. Now, I would want to begin by immediately going straight into this um, debate here. He ended with a challenge, and I would want to begin from where he left. I came into politics in the reading days of reformacy. I left academia, and it was at the request of uh, the late Ustaz Fadil Noor that uh, academicians, professionals should be coming in drove in pass as to you know provide that kind of shot in the arm kind of thing uh, for pass to really be you know transition into the center stage of Malaysian political landscape or scenario and I've always wanted to build this Islamic party of Malaysia pass with my thing thing and the many professionals that has almost now left pass few are around here <coughs> however I've come to you no know, we have come to a point where 
we no longer believe that the past could be molded and for past to graduate into the next phase of Islamic uh, political activism. Hence, the emergence of Amana would, I would dare say, is seen as, or rather, we want to believe, we would really want to believe that the emergence of Amana as the direct result of a failure of the first generation Islamic political party. Those that are constructed, framed and premised on a post-independence post kind of political activism. Essentially, striving to establish an Islamic state wherein the Sharia is the epitome of it all. The Islam al-Hal. Islam is the solution for all the problems of men. I am paraphrasing the an academics, and it's not of my coinage, I must say. That second generation Islamist political party is already here and will further evolve. If I may just quickly summarize the characteristic of the first generation of Islamic political party that I've you know, alluded to earlier, it's essentially a response to Western imperialism and colonization. But that generation, and to quote Halim Raimi from the Griffith, Griffith University Islamic Research Unit, he quoted those 20th century political parties that did not evolve are superseded by second generation Islamic political parties. And essentially, the new generation are premised on framing their political struggles and narrative, which is, of course, you know, in a nutshell, a graduation from the first generation Islamist political party. I want to believe that Amana presents that experience in relation context. And <clears throat> the narrative of a second generation contemporary Islamist political party and that unfortunate, but to a large extent, a blessing in disguise for many of us is seen as an opportunity to move away from this construct of the first generation Islamist political party. Islamists, by definition, is seen and perceived by the West and by Western Islamist scholar like um, among others would be Graham Fuller, you know, who, who wrote about the failure of his, the failure of political Islam, who essentially did, I mean, you know, these scholars, are essentially saying that Islamists are intrinsically undemocratic because they are against and opposed to popular rebuke, contest, and critique. And let me just summarize you on that by alluding to how PAS responded to the contest and critique of RUU355. That will quickly summarize that characteristic 
that char characterizes the first generation of Islamist political party. We believe, essentially, if I may also say that uh, Professor uh, Tariq Ramadan as well alluded to the second generation political, Islamic polit political party. He coined the term generational shift in the whole construct, the whole narrative of a contemporary Islamist political party. And breaking all norms and away from the Muslim Brotherhood construct would of course be the contemporary leader of Tunisia, Sheikh Rashid Ganoushi. When he finally pronounced that a Nahda party has evolved, not as Islamist Democrat anymore, but as a Muslim Democrat advocating democracy. Now, why is that so important, fellow friends? It's essentially premise on the fact that the ability to accept, contest, critique is cardinal to the whole narrative of a second generation Islamist political party. And I have no qualms to admit that a month before Sheikh Rashid Ganoushi make that pronouncement of shifting from Islamist Democrat to Muslim Democrat. Incidentally, I wrote in my FB that I make a conscious shift to becoming a Muslim Democrat. Maybe some of you, some like, you know, Shukri, Shukri, Shukri Mokhtar here would have noticed that. Why, friends? It's essentially because, it's not that I, of course, uh, I, was, I was fortunate and privileged enough to have, you know, been with Ganushi when I was doing my PhD in London way back in the early 90s when he took a political asylum in, in, in the UK, in London. But more importantly, may I just, you know, put this hopefully succinctly to all of you, that the ability to accept and in fact celebrate diversity, contest and critique characterizes the second generation Islamist political party. Because Islamism has got a lot to do as they define it, as the Western scholars define it, lot to do with the finally a political project to finally establish an Islamic state or implementation of the legal corpus of Sharia, particularly in regard to the penal code of Hudud, Kisaz and Ta'zir. Therefore, Islamism is at best problematic for Islamists to move forward. Hence, Rashid Ganushi, you know, consciously and ag against the entire narrative of, of the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, broke away. And we, in Amana, in Amana, believe that this is the way forward. Now, let me just share with you what it really means in the context of Malaysia. The perennial problem of our nation right now is essentially, what are they? If I might ask the young ones of you, what do you think is, what will be the top 10 issues in this coming 14 GE? Certainly many would say, uh, young men, cause of living, Cause of living, lagi? 
housing, unemployment, what else? GST. Are you you? Now, I would want to dare say that, of course, cost of living stands out top in all surveys, in all polls, none. However, this election would, you know, has the, has the, all the probability and the propensity to degenerate into finally a contest of so-called Islamic forces, again, anti-Islamic forces. Why? Because the Islamist political party of the first generation right now has come to almost right now working hand in glove with the power that be in Putrajaya, the one hoping to get a lifeline because of his government steep in kleptocracy and whatnot, corruptions and what have you. Hence, this contest, which supposedly to be a contest, we want to believe that way, a contest of policies of program, yeah, a, contest, a contestation of vision, leadership, has now turned to be most regrettably a contest of Islam against anti-Islamic forces. And by anti-Islamic forces are uh, you know, grouped together, lumped together, all those against the RUU, and in some ways against Zakir Naya and, and what have you. Fellow friends, this is surely not the way to rebuild this nation. Nation rebuilding and civilization remaking from our context as Amana and as well we want to believe we are the second generation Islamist political party. Even this word Islamist, I have, I have problem. I have, I've already told you. We will want to believe that it is now that we're going to come strong. Yes, the rural folks, Malays, are very, you know, can be bought in so easily by this emotive, emotive campaign that DAP, if Pakatan is doing, DAP is going to run this country, and maybe Lim Kei Shen will be the prime minister. No, no, they, they, honestly, this is this is not this this a serious campaign down there. Now, why must why why do I have to allude to this? Essentially, we have got to make sure that this 14G is not going to be reduced to a contest of those that are bringing the Muslim, Malay Muslim supremacist doctrine against the so-called anti-Islamic forces. So friends, Amana would want to believe that we have the solution to this deepening of racial divide and religious conflict and antagonisms. Because enshrined in the Quran are cardinal verses that celebrate, not only recognize, but celebrate plurality and, I'll be very careful not to use the word religious pluralism. I would, I would very judiciously use the word religious plurality because they've accused me and friends, of course, to be practitioner of religious pluralism. You know, relativizing, I mean, meaning, uh, if I may use simple word, you know, one that advocate all religions are, are the same. No. We very well understand that all religions have the right to the claim of absolute truth. That is very cardinal. Otherwise, why are you in that religion anyway? Now, let me come back. Yeah, so why do we want to come strong to this is to explain that Amana and Pakatan, you know, particularly Amana, we believe that 
religious plurality must be strongly advocated and that the Malay Muslim constituencies must understand this. That Islam must not be presented and advocated as essentially in a zero-sum game or at war with the adherents and believers of other faith. If I may be allowed to quote a few verses. First, on the verse where God says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَا جَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَلَكِنْ لِيَبُلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا آتَاكُمْ فَاسْتَوِكُ الْخَيْرَاتِ Had Allah will, He would have made you all into one united Ummah. No conflict of religious or whatever. But Allah says, but in fact, He has provided me whatever that He has given you and Enjoin fastabikul khairat. Enjoin the contest and competition as to who will be righteous in that contestation. Another verse. Walau sha Allahu la amana man fil ardi kulluhu jamia. Had Allah will, He would have made everyone on earth believe in Him in the sense of all of us belonging to one religion. But that is not the way of divine design and wisdom. And in fact, Allah made it very clear to the Prophet Muhammad and all of us, especially so-called, you know, Islamist party and da'wah group. Oh, this is what I really like. Would you hate man until he becomes Muslim like you, in simple terms. So friends, very sure, last verse, Hujurat, and this to me is so cardinal. Verse 13, very, very popular and familiar with all of you, when Allah declares, Ya ayuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnakum shu'awba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. Usually you read this verse, at that point, and brother son, abis kesi tu dulu. You stop at that. The most important verse is coming to finish that particular verse 13. Inna akramakum and Allah ya atqaqum. O mankind, we have created you from male and female, and from then nation and tribe, so that perchance you may li ta'arafu. The politic of knowing, the politic of recognizing, the politic of celebrating others as others. And what is most important in the ending of the verse? In the akramakum indullahi atqaqum. Verily, the one who is righteous in the eyes of Allah is the one who the one who is nearest to the eyes of Allah is the one who is most righteous. And the mufassirin, those that you know make exegesis of the Quran, says that why did Allah say the one righteous in his eyes? Yeah, is the one most, you know, God-fearing. What has that got to do with the verse? The verse begin by a narrative. The verse begin by recognizing the existence of diversity. So we believe, as a second generation Islamist Muslim political parties, we believe that the way forward for second generation political parties that premise themselves on an inclusive Islam, on a progressive Islam, on a democratic Islam, is the one that is most capable to manage and handle this diversity and mutually conflict, mutually exclusive demands and constraint of all people of faith, of all racial, ethnic, of all cultural needs and whatnot. So friend, contrary, yeah, contrary to to the first generation Islamist political party, we believe the way forward for Islam. And that is a model, I think, alluded by my good friend, uh, Waibi Chintong, that a challenge on these contemporary Islamist or Muslim political parties is essentially to frame their narrative on the ability to manage and more importantly, to be engaged critically 
as important critical political players in nation rebuilding premised on an inclusive, progressive, democratic Islam. There's just simply no way for RUU. You know our critique on, critique on RUU. Empowering and strengthening of Sharia court is just not simply by upping the ante on the limits of punishment. I would not want to go into that discourse. It is for another, another discourse, perhaps. So, friends, now this is why, if I may just conclude, I wrap up. With your permission. This is why, almost like a a new revelation, almost like a renaissance, almost like a um, should I say a revisit of the Marquisate of Sharia, the higher intents and purposes of Sharia was the reason why we came, was the reason why it is possible to transition from the first generation to the second generation political party. The Marquisate of Sharia, more than just the illegal reductionism of Sharia, you know what I mean by legal reduction, reducing everything of Sharia to just punishment is the way forward for second generation political party that enjoy Islam as a political force to be together in nation rebuilding. If I may just again reiterate that, because I, I don't think not much I've been talking not but not much I've been talk about perhaps on Marcosid, but if I if there are few of you on for the first time listening to, to me and to others on Marcosid, Marcosid Sharia as the author of uh, Dr. Halim Remy, in the title of his, of his very long uh, uh, um, write-up, the relevance of a Marcasid approach for political Islam post-Arab Revolution 2013. From Griffiths University, we would like to take a note and you can Google that. So, narrated quite extensively and comprehensively. When you get to internalizing and when you get to really understand, to understand Makhazi do Sharia, more importantly than just simply looking at Islam as a, a corpus of legal prescription, and hence ending in the RUU as a typical and epitome of the first generation, Islamist political party, you know, that believes that everything will be solved if you get to implementing Hudud, Tisas or Tazir. So friends, in this most difficult situation, uh, coming from, as I said earlier, you know, um, I would stop at this, and I would hope to engage further to you, to, you know, to, to perhaps uh, share and enlighten the other aspect of why Makassi do Sharia would be the way forward for the second generation Islamist political party, addressing public policies not just on race relation and religious conflict and whatnot, but more importantly, on cause of living, on housing, on more importantly, of how a vibrant democracy, of rule of law, of separation of power, of al-faslu bayna sultat, you know, making democracy vibrant and functional. We have now a completely dysfunctional government. So with that, I must stop because I saw Ehsan <laughs> standing up. And with that again, thank you, Ehsan, for the kind extension. I thank you. Well, I think uh, Dr. Zulkifli have made it quite clear when it comes to the, the direction of progressive politics uh, in Muslim societies, the focus must be on important ideals and principles of Islam, good governance, uh, discussing policies, not the politics which will create division, particularly playing then Islam and anti-Islam um, uh, types of politics and also the focus on diversity and how he emphasized, emphasized on the maqasid sharia as the direction of politics and, and also an, an, an interesting uh, point which uh, Dr. Zulkifli made was that the thing or the issue with past before in his own word I would put it as past basically failed to graduate you know Failed to graduate, yeah. So, uh, 
uh, to basically towards this new types of Islamic politics which focuses on values, which focuses on good policies. They are still in the mode of playing the religious and the Islamic card, political card, which I mean. So it's not for me to answer whether they did pass graduate or not, or whether Amanah is actually the version of the, graduate, the graduated Islam, right? So I think to answer that, it's just perfect for us to have a professor to answer, not coming from a political party, either whichever political party. So I think I will just pass uh, the next uh, session to uh, Professor Noraini. Perhaps Professor Noraini could also touch on the role of women in progressive politics as well, which has not been discussed before. Okay, Prof. Thank you, Ehsan. And thank you to IRF and all fellow participants uh, for being here in the room for this final forum. Now, I think I will cut it to the chase. The whole issue of freedom of religion, I'm going to just focus on freedom of expression and freedom of thought within the local context, within the societal context, meaning in the educational system, particularly at the university level, that is so crucial for preparing our younger generation, our youths, uh, to be the participant and actors as adults in politics, society, and economics yeah, of Malaysian society. Now, let me just uh, begin with a short story. Well, not short, narration of looking at past events. In 1986, when I came back, uh, from England as a very enthusiastic and hardworking young lecturer, I interviewed Saudara Kasim Ahmad, who has just been released from Kemunting for the detention. And he, he told me of how he spent the time there. He was doing a lot of research and reading on Islam, particularly on the issue of fiqh. And then he moved, he, he said, to understand about fake, about the teaching of Islam, fake, and what Quranic teaching is, he decided to focus on the hadith. So he had, by the time he came up, he had a, the draft, a manuscript of a seven chapter book on theory hadith, menilai hadith dalam pemikiran Islam. So I organized a seminar in Jabatan Anthropology and Sociology UKM for Saudara Kasim just to give a talk. And once the flyer and the announcement came out, I was called up by the head of department and the dean of the faculty of social science and uh, FSKK at that time to tell me that there has been a complaint, a report for this seminar to be stopped, which is meaning a ban, putting, you know, not allowing you to even discuss, to learn, to understand some of the basic things in Islam. And I found out that the complaint came via the Faculty Pengajian Islam. And, and so I lobbied and early in the morning sat outside the office of the Minister of Education at that time it was Patla, and to lobby him and to explain that this is, you know, this is, this is only for for discussion, this is for knowledge, and if, and if we prevent this, there, there, won't be, there won't be any quality in the thinking of our student. So Patla relented and allowed and said, only by invitation and only to student and not open to the media and to the public. So fine, so, so we made the preparation. That was about a month later from the first scheduled date. And then two days before we begin, we were told that it came from the head of Islam in the state of Slango. UKM is in Slango, meaning the Sultan. So somebody have lobbied the Sultan to put a stop to say that sociologist and a person like Saudara Kasim, who's, who's only been writing on politics and leftist politics, have no credential to talk about Islam. So that is the kind of you know, unfreedom, the kind of restraint, the kind of banning and the kind of prevention to your thinking and to your pursuit of knowledge. And that, that is part of the, that I think is the big and the main challenge to progressive uh, Muslim society in Malaysia. This was in 1986. And then 10 years later in 1996, I was a 
founding fellow of this newly founded research institute. So I thought, I, like Liu Chintong, I go a bit global. And I got some money from overseas and tried to organize a, an international conference, questioning and challenging all kinds of religious fundamentalism and extremism. And again, there were moves from various sectors of the uh, what should, actors within the politics, Islamist politics. So there was a complaint coming from uh, Satuan Ulama. There was a complaint coming from people in religious studies saying that how can uh, a research institute and that is dealing with the studies of social science uh, organize this conference. Well, the conference is, I managed to get the money and the permission to, to bring in Hindu, uh, a scholar that specialized in understanding Hindu fundamentalism. I even got a Jewish scholar to come in to talk about his research on um, Jewish fundamentalism. And I also got someone from Germany who's willing to speak and present a paper based on his research on human rights fundamentalism. So it was, it was open. It, it doesn't pick and choose. You know, uh, it's open to discuss all kind of fundamentalism. And yet again, it was banned, and I was interrogated by the special branch. How did I get this Jewish scholar from? Uh, <laughs> from Palestine to, you know, to, to come over to Malaysia. So then in 2006, I must have been a, a bad lecturer. Every 10 years I get into trouble. <laughs> in 2006, my book on the challenge, uh, gender equality and the challenge of Islamic extremism was banned. It has come out two years before that in 2004, but the book was banned in 2006. So what I'm trying to point out is that this is the challenge to progressive Malays Muslim Malaysian society, to a progressive uh, Islamic knowledge, to progressive of thinking about Islam. Because I am not, well, I, okay, I'm an activist, but most of these activities are based on academic uh, discipline, on academic consideration. So. That is one of the biggest challenge of how we want to open the space of freedom of expression and freedom of thought in our educational institution. And why, how can we challenge, how, why do we allow the politicians and the governmental authorities, such as various Jabatan Agama, particularly in this role was Jakim, in the banning of the book, as I investigated later before the court hearing where Sisters in Islam challenged the banning of the book, I found out that it was based only from a complaint from one individual from the public. There was no attempt by Jakim to call me up for a discussion, have a panel of experts uh, to interrogate me on the various chapters of the book. The, the various chapters of the book are based from contribution by other um, feminist, Muslim feminist academics working in their own respective countries, trying to explain and understand how the challenge of Islamic narrowness of Islamic thinking, of Islamic extremism, impinge on understanding of women's rights in Islam from an Islamic perspective. So it's it's free, that, that, freedom, that, that freedom, that constraint on the freedom of expression and freedom of thought and allowing a governmental authority to play such, such a role in the higher education of the country, that is a challenge to the development of a progressive Malaysian Muslim society. And this is University Kebangsaan Malaysia. And I've lobbied then the, the Minister of Education, the one in 1996 was Anwar Ibrahim himself. And of course, it was of to no avail. And in fact, there was a call from Najib as the Minister of Education later to, for the university and for the vice chancellor to take disciplinary action. I was again fortunate because the, the vice chancellor at that time stood up 
and said she has done nothing wrong. She has followed the procedure. I followed the procedure of applying for special permission from uh, from the various government department to get foreign speakers, foreign scholars to come for that 1996 conference. So I was very lucky. I, there was no disciplinary action, but that vice chancellor was not renewed. He was only he became a vice chancellor only for one term. Usually in UKM, you go on at least for two to three terms. So these are the things. What I want to point out is that we should not allow governmental authorities such as JAKIM, Jabatan Agama, and then NGOs such as Persatuan Ulama to harass freedom of expression, to har harass individuals and academic and researchers in their work towards understanding Islam within the political arena, Islam and its connection to political political system to the politicization of religious ideas. And even recently, board members of Sisters in Islam, because they were the main funder to my research that has now come to a completion, I look forward to the publication early next year, of my study of the practice of polygamy among Muslim men, Muslim uh, society in peninsular Malaysia. So there was a closed door meeting in Shah Alam, interrogating me because towards within that last two, three years of doing the research, I also got money to invite what we call progressive scholars from Egypt and then from Indonesia uh, to interrogate the interpretation of Quranic verses and also uh, the Sunnah and the Hadith about polygamy that polygamy is not a right. Polygamy is only allowed under very certain strict conditions. And it was, it was a workshop that has been spelled out clearly, the academic and the theoretical um, assumption and objectives of that uh, workshop. And yet again, there was an attempt. But unfortunately for me, they only found out the workshop after it was over. So I was quite happy to meet up with them in closed door and to be questioned. So that was my, my last stint in, acti in activism and doing research on Islam. And I just completed the book on polygamy. And I look forward, if I find the money, to do the, res to the, res to do the research with Chin Tong on the subject uh, of his choice. <laughs> So I stop there. We can go on on further discussion. I can elaborate certain points related to my main argument that freedom of expression, freedom of thought within the educational, higher education system in Malaysia should not be compromised. Thank you very much. So Prof. Norani's emphasis mainly is on education. In the local context. In the local context particularly, as progressive politics, even if you cannot limit the role and the authority of government so that they don't interfere, particularly on academic freedom, that will definitely will not create a more progressive Muslim society. That is more or less I could take as one of the main key points from Prof. Norani's presentation. So I think there's a lot, there are still a lot of questions unanswered. And I think I will give this opportunity for the floor to perhaps give your own commentaries. You can also give some questions to the panels. And we'll start with the first three questions first. So please um, raise your hand, anyone with the questions? Uh, 